retired first woman chaplain of the United States Air Force first chief of chaplains of our United States Air Force ma'am it is an honor to share with you today for our Royal Air Force Milden Hall DNI Women's Month Women's History Month and we're kicking our month off with you ma'am there is no better person to do that with and we're so inspired uh, by your leg legacy, and we are excited to hear from you, glean from you, and hear you share your personal story and professional story of your experience as a woman and as a chaplain in our United States Air Force. So we have a few questions from our members, but we're going to start um, with what you want to share with us, your story, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's also nice to be invited back when I've spoken before before someone like yourself and you say, oh, I want you to come and do this for me. So thank you. Uh, it also ca causes me to pause and reflect on, you know, what's happened over the last 50 years. I can't believe it's been that long, but 50 years uh, to do this. And Women's History Month is so important because it causes all of us to look at the legacy of women in our nation and kind of where we've come over the generations. Uh, and my career, I think, uh, represents some of the significant changes that have occurred, particularly in our military. Uh, so I, I thank you again. My I want to start out with a question that I was asked not too long ago, and it was, what made you successful in breaking the stained glass ceiling in two male dominated career fields, the church and the military? Mm. Well, my first answer, first, I have two part answer. The first one is I was very confident in my call from God that I was to do something in ministry and I was seeking after where my place was to do ministry. So I had a, a higher power <laughs> saying, this is where you need to go. And, I, and also I realized I was very well prepared. I was prepared because of the values of my family and my schooling and education, and also some of my work experiences. The second part was when the challenges came, you have to have a strong support. And I am blessed with a husband who supported and encouraged me through even the most difficult of times. He's a retired army chaplain, uh, but at the time he was active duty too. And because he knew the environment I was in, it was also helpful. So that's my two part answer of why I feel like I be became successful in, in kind of breaking some of the ceilings. I wanna start a little bit with my family background. Being privileged to be in this great country, <laughs> to live here, and they cho their families chose to be here was well ingrained in, 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 into us. Education was important. I was told that I could do anything that I wanted to if I worked hard, and I was willing to pay the price. After once I decided that, I ended up to even going to the college I went to was a faith step. My father earned $200 a week. A college at that time, which is cheap now, $2,100. I wasn't even going to apply because we couldn't afford it. But he said, God will provide. If that's where you want to go and you're accepted, do it. I think that, that my, for my family, my mother's influence and my father's determination that we were to get education and be able to provide for ourselves was significant. I must say that in college, I was heading towards some kind of ministry, but I had the crisis of my father's terminal illness and my God was, was dead. But I decided that I needed to seek after finding him again and continued, went on to seminary. Seminary was the first time I encountered discrimination. Mm. There were only six women in the, in the seminary uh, that were full-time and was continually asked, what are you doing here? Why do you want to be here? Women shouldn't be pastors. Mm. 
But I, I found a group of support there. And after three years of seminary, I realized that I, ne I needed to, to do some kind of pastoral ministry because I wanted to go into chaplaincy. Mm -hmm. I think an interesting story was that in 1971, I had to go before my ordination council. That was a credential, you know, you, you had to have that in order to be go into chaplaincy of any kind. And I was at my ordination council and I was presenting my theological paper and someone who had come in late said, interrupted and asked, whose theological paper is Lorraine presenting? Hmm. You see, no woman had ever been ordained there. While my mother was a licensed minister there, she wasn't, she wasn't educated, schooled, or ordained. She was a volunteer. Mm. Uh, whose was it? Well, that was my first taste that not everyone is most welcome for women in the church. And even today, their churches do not have to accept whoever they don't want, <laughs> including women. You know, and they're individuals who are strongly opposed to women being pastors because of their theological understanding or biases or whatever. But I was called to do ministry, and I decided since I couldn't get a church position that I would go on, and I went on for two years of residency training in New Haven for clinical pastoral education. Once I'd gotten done that, I found there what my real ministry calling was, and that was to be with people who are in crisis. I thought it was hospital ministry, but any place where people were dealing with the, with the challenges and, and difficulties of life, and part of that was because of my own challenge as I went through my own understanding of, of where God was in the midst of my father's suffering and then his death. I found out that I wanted to be a fellow traveler. I wanted to walk beside people who are in crisis, but I needed to find a place to do this. My context, therefore, was find a crisis ministry to get involved with. Was looking for a place to do ministry. My brother had served in the army. That was important to our family because we wanted to pay back, pay back for living in this country. Also, I had some colleagues who'd been in the military and a couple had been chaplains. So I decided to write to the Air Force Chief of Chaplain's Office asking if it were possible for a woman to be a chaplain in the military. Yeah. Not very assertive. Mm -hmm. The first letter I got, I got a response and it was actually a form letter and it listed the qualifications for a chaplain in the military. And you, you understand what they are. You know, you met every one of them, Chaplain Ray. The first one is you have to have a baccalaureate degree. You have to have three years of seminary. You must have a minimum of two to three years of pastoral experience, but you must be endorsed by our denomination. Mm -hmm. And the last qualification was be male. Mm. I met all of them except the last one. So I thought, well, I'll just wait God has some plan in mind. I'll continue to look. It was only several weeks later, though, I got a second letter from the chief of chaplains, and it said that, oh, uh, the chief of chaplains has uh, deleted the requirement to be male. Well, actually, there was federal law had been passed several years before the Equal Employment Opportunity, which forbids federal governments to discriminate based on race gender, nationality. So they said if my denomination was willing to do it, they would consider my coming in. I must say I was vetted very thoroughly, had five interviews, three by my church and two by the Air Force. But I was a little hesitant because I'd be first. Now remember, I said I was a twin. Even at birth, I didn't want to be first. I sent her out one hour before me to check it out. And I will say as a child, whenever we were going to new things, if there was a new program, I would always probably fake being ill so she could go the first day and check it out for me. Uh, my husband said I learned how to use a staff member early to check things out. Yeah. 
But I, and I also realized that being first, I was going to live in a fishbowl. Everyone's the whole 31 years I was on active duty, I never took an anonymous survey for the United States Air Force. Because when you fill all those blocks about what your career field is, what your gender is, what your base is, what your grade is, I was always the only one in that category. So if they wanted to find out who I was, they could. But I was concerned that what if I went in, I would have to stay because I did not want to make it difficult for any woman who would follow me. And I was constantly conscious of that throughout my career. I didn't want to be first, but the door was open and God and I said, we'll, we'll handle this together. I was called and now the Air Force was willing to give me a place to do ministry. So on, in September of 1973, decades ago now, I was the first woman commissioned so that I could help provide for the free exercise of religion for others. I quickly learned that military life is daily a crisis for individuals within our, within our service. It's a crisis because of the business we're in, and we never know what danger is going to be there, excuse me. <clears throat> but also the crises affect families. Every time you get PCS orders, the older your children get or the more secure your spouse is in their position, that's a crisis. Mm. You go on a deployment, that's a crisis. When there's a family health issue, that's a crisis. So I found out that I was definitely in a crisis ministry, and that's where God wanted me to go. I went to the chaplain's orientation class in Montgomery, Alabama. <clears throat> now, let me tell you, this Yankee girl going down to Alabama in 1973, talk about culture shock. It was amazing. The other thing was, I, while I had experienced challenges about my being in ministry at seminary. It was, it was awful with my classmates. Mm. This challenge directly that I had taken a, a position, a, a very, and we only did 30 chaplains a year at that time. I was taking a position from a more qualified, more deserving male. Mm. They didn't know my background. They didn't know the vetting process and found out that I would probably had more experience and training than all of them. They also were afraid I'd get the good assignments. Mm. Big question was would I go on a, on a uh, remote assignment, the deployments, mm. or would I just get nice, easy jobs? Mm. I was very isolated. I was there four and a half weeks before I was invited to go to dinner with with others. Mm. Uh, it was, uh, but I knew that, hey, I survived three years in seminary. I can survive six weeks in chaplain school. And I was where God wanted me to do, to be. Uh, and fortunately, they were sending me to Wilford Hall. I was going to a, an assignment that was what I was trained for. I'd been doing hospital ministry for three years. I was the most trained hospital chaplain out of 10 who were serving at Wilfrid Hall at the time. So I didn't know much about the Air Force, but I knew about hospital ministry. And that is was a learning lesson. Whenever you go to a new job, be sure you're doing something you're very comfortable doing, very qualified to do, while you're learning new things. And I was able to learn about the Air Force those 18 months that I was there. I was setting up a training program in clinical training for other chaplains, which was also kind of surprising as being the, uh, the new person on the, on the block. But when they canceled the clinical pastoral training program there, off to Korea. Mm -hmm. I was the first one in my class who ended up going remote. And that was their biggest concern. <clears throat> was I going to get an easy assignment? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, the Lord and I talked all the way. Remember, I don't like new things. Don't like going very far from home. 
but I found that there were great opportunities for ministry there. There were only 50 women out of 3,000 assigned at Osan Air Base. But I was found out uh, there was a purpose for my presence there as they were integrating women into that kind of assignment. And it was here that I had my most significant professional experience that made every challenge I had in the, ne in the next 28 years that I served worth it. And I wanna share this story with you because it reflects the great differences. And as those listening can hear, great differences both within the religious community and in our military. It was Christmas Eve of 1975 and a priest and I and several of musicians, Korean guitar players were going to remote sites. And I found myself on a remote mountaintop and, and you know, you've been there, Chaplain Ray, it's cold in December and we're in the, on a mountaintop and they wanted to do Christmas Eve service in this little stone chapel, which was not heated. Mm. But there were 50 people who attended. There were our airmen, there were some soldiers, there were, there were French soldiers, and there were Korean soldiers who joined us as Americans. Mm. The priest and I shared the service. This is 1975 ecumenical things with Catholic and Protestants did not happen. But we jointly joined in because we wanted to proclaim the good news of God's birth, to celebrate. Although many of us were depressed and feeling extra lonely, we, they, all, they seemed to all wanna gather in in sense of community to celebrate. The scriptures of Jesus' birth were read in English, French, and Korean. We sang the Christmas carols and simultaneously we sang them in our own language. The priest and I celebrated at the altar table together serving communion. He served the Eucharist to the Catholics and I served to the Protestants. We listened carefully and we could hear the still small voice of a baby's cry reminding us that through Jesus, we have a God who travels with us. God who doesn't let us go alone. And we also could hear the promises of that majestic hymn of peace on earth, goodwill to all. That's what we were serving there for was to maintain peace. And most important, we were there to remind each other that God loved us so much that he gave. There is no place in 1975 in this whole world other than in the United States military could I, as this little girl chaplain, could have had that kind of opportunity to minister and share. And that reflected what was to come, to come in our churches, to come in our interfaith relationships. Well, I'm the first who came on active duty as a woman in the Air Force. We now have our first woman Muslim chaplain who just graduated and here it is 48 years later. Yeah. There are great changes that have occurred. I will say when I reflect back, I had many challenges. There were barriers and there were a lot of questions. People still would look when they'd see a cross on my uniform, kind of a gas that a woman would dare be a preacher and a pastor and a chaplain. And you can imagine what they thought when I became a general officer. But surpri surprising to me, I thought once I got in and once I had gone to Korea, and I will tell you, going to Korea was the best thing that happened to me career-wise because when my male colleagues all thought I was now a real chaplain. Wow. I was, they didn't think I was real before, but I was a real chaplain. I had gone and I had served in a remote in a deployment and that's true for us now. Once you serve in the real Air Force or the real military, that's a deployed site, you earn some credibility for it. But I was challenged at every place throughout my career. And I was surprised because I had been vetted carefully all along the way. I lived in this fishbowl. Everyone knew 
if there was a woman chaplain's name mentioned, I was there and I carried the responsibility. And I will say at every promotion level, I had fulfilled every requirement, not only that the Air Force chaplaincy had put out, but what the line officers had required. And I will say that's also true. When I was selected to be the Brigadier General, I was the only chaplain colonel who had fulfilled every requirement and the only one I had that the others did not have, which they soon had after, was that I had served in a joint RDOD. Wow. I'll stop there because I want you to kind of help direct me where you want me to go. Absolutely. You took us exactly where we needed to go. You actually went through all the questions that were posed. You answered them except for the one, which is we have time for one more question. And that is that last, um, that last question. What nugget of wisdom, as if you haven't already given us enough, but what nugget of wisdom in these different trying times um, and challenges would you like to share with other women and all those that are watching to inspire them, uplift them, and uh, just admonish them to live their greatest military lives and just lives as women, whatever careers they pursue. Uh, first of all, I, I want to remind each one of us that we represent <clears throat> not only ourselves, we represent our nation. We, re we represent our families. We represent our faith. And people are watching us so that we must be sure that when the challenges come, when we're disappointed no, or when we're overwhelmed, that we act with integrity. We act with grace. But most of all, you got to remember that you're part of a team. You don't do it by yourselves. <clears throat> One of the most important lessons I, earned, I learned very early, and it was from a surprising source. My church had written, asked me for a report. And one of the questions it asked was, what have you done to minister to your organization? Now, I'm a chaplain serving in a hospital. I've been on active duty less than less than 10 months, what have I done for the Air Force? That's an important question. It's not just about Lorraine. It's not just about the chaplaincy. It's about what difference are you making to, uh, to the organization, to make the Air Force or to make the military environment a better place to live? So that's the question I'd say, look at, you've got to know your organization, know it, know your own job. You're on a team. And if you find yourself looking at what's in it for me, you're going to miss the opportunities to be the, the, the part of a team that wins. Because when one person wins, that's a, that's a minute success. When the organization wins, all win. That's it's right. like watching the basketball teams you like. You know, yes. you can have a LeBron James, but I can tell you he doesn't win it alone. And we've seen that happen. That's, right. That's true for each of us. So my nugget of wisdom is to say, look for where you can make a difference. Know the rules of the game. Be part of the be part of a team, and be proud of what you're doing. I think that you know, I want to say that the most important thing that I learned was from the most difficult thing that happened to me. I want to say this in a constructive, positive way, and that was that when I was selected to be a general officer, there were colleagues who were most distressed that I had gotten that position. They thought they deserved it. But I also know that what happened was the charges that were, were brought against me were, were by colleagues who never spoke to me directly about what the issues were. It was uh, based on hearsay and lies. And then it proceeded to spread like a disease. Mm. What happens is that, that, you, that I find out in that challenge, what's important, you're being stretched. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you 
you're also be, you're, you're being trained. And I will say that the best compliment I ever received was after I retired was to have several younger chaplains say, I appreciate the grace in which you continued to be focused on the job, to continue to realize that the ministry and the Air Force was most important to you. So I say, know the rules, but also know what how it is to correct things. And I will say that, that we've had a lot of changes. And I'm gonna go on to one of your questions, Chaplain. The question is a lot of changes that we've had. Just look at the recruiting ads, ladies, yeah. gentlemen, to see all those women pilots on that ad. You know, it says, wow, we've come a long way. And I was talking with a, a Navy woman who lives in my community, who was the first Navy pilot who, who took off and landed on an aircraft carrier ever. And she said what surprises her is when she talks to other women, it's no big deal to them now. Hmm. She did that. Yeah. And she that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. So when you say, what changes have we had? If you look in the, the religious community, and I'm going to use the Episcopal Church, for example, the Episcopal Church did, didn't have any women in leadership. I will say now, I bet you 40 or 50 percent of all the the Episcopal priests in our country are women now. Mm. We don't, so we don't think about that. So that change is so so positive. Yeah. But remember, you're part of a team. You're part of a team. I, I'm going to share a story that relates to that. Um, when I was promoted to Brigadier General, I had forgotten to buy uh, star epaulets for my sweater, mm. and. I found out later that there was no heat in my office and they fixed that after I retired, but the heat had never been connected in our building for the chief and deputy's office, but I was cold. So I went over to the clothing sales store, which was just across, across a big field to get some epaulets for my sweater. And it, all of us who have to buy that know that they all hang on the wall. You know, they're insignia. They go from, from, from the airman on up to the to the E9, and you go down from second lieutenant on up. Well, you know, when I was a major, I could reach that. I'm five foot tall. I could reach the major's insignia very, very easily. Yeah. I found that I was looking at the wall, and I couldn't reach the one star insignia. Hmm. I turned around, and there was this two striper airman. He must have been six feet. <laughs> and I turned to him, and I said to airman. Can you help me to reach that star? Hmm. He did. That's good. But so did the people who worked with me, my family, my colleagues, everyone that I was had been in association with helped me to reach that star. That's right. And that's the importance of being part of this wonderful team that we serve to represent our country. We have challenges. And I'm going to say to you, particularly to the women, you need to deal with the issues of sexual assault and sexual harassment because that does more damage to not only the person, but to our reputation within the organization and around the world. Yeah. And we know that, that that's going to continue because of human nature. But find ways to support one another, to address it, and try to prevent it. Yes. Thank you, Chaplain. Potter, you make me feel like I can do anything. And I'm sure that's the truth for all of our listeners. Every time I have an interaction conversation, read something about you, you just make us all feel like we can do anything. And I literally stand atop your shoulders. So thank you for pioneering the way and giving your wisdom and taking the time out to give back. Um, you, you help us to live the lives that we're destined to live just by nature of being you. And that's amazing. Your legacy is amazing. And I know you've heard this before, but I cannot sing your praises enough. Thank you for being with us. We are out of time, but we are so grateful to have you with us to help us kick off our DNI Women's History Month. Chaplain Major General Lorraine K. Potter retired. Well done. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. And thank you for your service, all of you, because 
Every one of you is needed and you are making a difference. Thank you. God bless y'all. Thank you, ma'am. Until next time. Stay in touch. Yes, ma'am. Will do. Thank